All right, welcome back. I am Colin Wallace Jr. And I talk about businesses that impact you. So that can be retail, consumer, tech, you name it, you'll find it right here. So like, comment, subscribe, download, read, wherever you get your content, we're right there. So follow along so you don't miss anything. Um, so let's get right into it. Today, we're talking about commercial real estate. And obviously, very tough time since COVID. This was a industry that was doing quite well before COVID. You know, we all worked, or most of us at least, worked in an office, um, nine to five, Monday to Friday, all the foot traffic that comes from that and, you know, the downtown parts of whatever city you're in. Um, but COVID obviously turned that on its head, right? And now we're at an industry where growth is negative, but traffic isn't back to what it was. Um, and we've got all these empty units and people who work in this industry are wondering, okay, will this ever um, come back to what it was, right? So when you look at commercial real estate, you've got three main buckets, right? So kind of industrial, office, and retail. We'll leave industrial to the side. That's kind of a different beast altogether. Um, but essentially, you know, we'll look at office and retail. And retail, obviously, you've got food. That's kind of a, a main bucket and then kind of everything else. So first, a little background. So pre-COVID, the five years leading up to that, commercial real estate was growing at a rate of about just under 3% a year. So call it GDP, um, call it inflation, whatever you want to call it, kind of humming along with uh, the broader economy as a whole. Um, but now we're at a point where I was reading an article in Bloomberg, 20% of commercial real estate is sitting empty in major cities. Um, you know, and rents have come down, but people still don't want to, you know, sign up for a new lease or anything like that. Um, prices in Manhattan, I was reading another article where they're down 26%. Uh, you know, so when we look at prices that are down this much, whether it's 20%, whether it's 30%, whatever article you want to, you know, cite, I guess the question is, is this permanent or is this something that we're going to see slowly but surely, you know, people going back to the office, foot traffic coming back, people going back to restaurants and all that kind of good stuff. So what's changed? So working from home, right? That's obviously been a huge thing post COVID. Um, Stanford puts out some research on this. And they're showing that 40% of people who can work from home do so in some capacity, whether that's full time, whether that's hybrid. Um, and that's obviously up substantially um, from pre-COVID, right? When this wasn't really a cultural thing. Seems like, you know, the era of strict Monday to Friday, five days a week, um, that might be over. Um, you know, it could change, but, you know, we'll get into that a little bit further on. But sticking with just kind of the overview of what's changed since then. Um, E-commerce, obviously, right? Um, showing some stats here that retail continues to grow at about 10% per year, um, which is just staggering when you realize that before all of this, you know, people still went to the store and e-commerce was growing. Yes, yes, yes. But now with COVID, it's just kind of accelerated that, right? And a lot of places that, again, used to get a certain amount of foot traffic, they're not really seeing that as much anymore. And um, it kind of aligns with this just secular shift of people want to shop more online and you know just going to the store just to pick things up as opposed to really browsing and spending some time and that sort of thing and coming up with maybe you know two three four more bags than uh, than you might have anticipated going in um this was kind of interesting as well a bit of a shift from goods to services so honestly when the pandemic hit we were all stuck at home and essentially people were just kind of buying things to replace the ability to get out there and do things, um, you know, out in the real world. So there was a huge spike in goods purchases and coupled with kind of the shift to online, we saw a lot of that during kind of the pandemic and kind of just post pandemic era. Now that we're all allowed back outside again, um, we're seeing a bit of a difference. It's a lot more service oriented. So, you know, hopefully some of that's trickling to restaurants, but we're seeing a lot in terms of travel, tourism, 
theater or like all those services and things that are related to experiences are getting a bit of a surge now um, as opposed to just kind of your brick and mortar retail store um, so when you combine all these things together um, does this spell trouble for commercial real estate long term i think again that's the question is this permanent um, is, is this a persistent thing that we're going to see or is it just for now or will we land somewhere in the middle so criteria for success i think i would look at it as can this industry get back to a pre-covid growth rate so if we're saying that that was three percent a year can they get back to that um you know i'm not too sure we'll get into some ideas now but right now that growth rate is negative right and they're there it's, it's substantially um i would say underwater right now like if your prices are down 26 percent from pre-covid you know um and units are sitting a 20 percent empty you know that's not a good spot to be in and you know the the path to getting back to three percent it's probably a long one so um so with that let's uh let's let's dig into some ideas okay so for the ideas now i kind of thought it would be interesting to break this up into two buckets right so you've got kind of your old world strategies and what i'll call your new world <laughs> strategies right so the old world would be pretty much any strategy around forcing people back to the office right forcing people back to work trying to push people back to in, into retail stores, all that sort of thing. So we're already seeing some of that. I think a lot of the major, um, you know, companies in, in economies around the world are saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna lead by pushing our employees back to the office. And then that might spur some of the other businesses around. You're seeing this in banks um, in particular, um, you know, kind of pushing their, pushing their employees back to the office and hoping that that kind of um, creates a bit of a domino effect with the other industries around them and, you know, helps to bring that industry back to life. So, so that's kind of one, right? Um, two would be, you know, working with uh, employees and lawmakers to um, be a bit more positive and kind of work with people to say, okay, what is it that you don't like about coming into the office and how can we improve that, right? So companies that didn't offer you know, all the lunches and little perks, that sort of thing before They're, they might be starting to do that more of that now. Um, and then also kind of, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if companies kind of do something around kind of the transit or the commute, um, you know, offering to pay for your transit pass or something like that, that could get people, um, you know, interested in maybe going back. So kind of strategies around pushing people back to the office. And I think that that's something that we're, we're starting to see a lot of now because a lot of the people that run these companies that run these businesses, they're, they're part of just that old guard that their whole, um, you know, business model revolved around that. And you don't want to see that go away or it's, it's easier to think of ways to go back to the old as opposed to going into the new, which is, you know, a bit scary for some people who might not be, you know, comfortable with that level of, uh, of that level of change. So that's kind of one bucket. And that's probably where, I, you know, unfortunately, you know, I think we'll see a lot of that, at least over the near term. Um, I'd like to see some of the new world um, kind of strategies that I'll, I'll get into in a moment, but really just ideas around saying, hey, this is a new world that we're in now. How can we create something that works for this new economy um, that we're, we're going to see ourselves in for the foreseeable future? And one point that I'd start with on that is I think it would make sense to start focusing more on um, smaller office spaces, spaces that are more flexible, spaces that appeal to, you know, small businesses, professional services, that sort of thing where, you know, yes, you can absolutely do your job from home, but sometimes it is nice to have a space here and there to, you know, invite clients, have a board meeting, um, have a strategy session with your team, um, stuff like that, where it's a bit more informal as opposed to Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I think that would be helpful, um, especially with folks that are, you know, out further away, they've moved to the suburbs, they've moved further away from the city, um, types of, you know, satellite offices or ideas where people don't have to commute in um, all the time, right? And I think that it'd be interesting to see kind of the demographics of how many people 
have moved out to these different um, suburban communities and um, how many of the kind of the young professionals that would typically be going to, you know, a, a hip bar in the city or a certain tourist attractions, that sort of thing. They're no longer in the city. Now they're further out. And it'd be interesting to see if, hey, maybe it's worth bringing some of those attractions, some of those retail um, locations and things that no longer work in a downtown, you know, Wall Street type context, seeing if now that works out on on Main Street, right out in the suburbs, out where people um, might be kind of moving out to, if it's worth bringing some of those um, ideas out there and you, you kind of just repurpose them for just a different community. Um, so that's kind of one. Um, two and kind of building off that would be, I've always thought that kind of just, again, just kind of a more campus library style um, kind of atmosphere where obviously you can talk. I'm not saying everybody's got to be uh, dead quiet, but kind of more you come in, at, you come in and you leave um, as you need to, as opposed to, you know, here's my desk, here's all my pictures, here's all my things at my specific desk and I've got to be here again, Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, I think that's changing and I think um, when you kind of look at it from the perspective of almost like a university campus where a lot of us when we were in school it's like you know yeah you can study from your dorm room or from home or you can do your work from home but a lot of us sometimes would go on to campus meet with friends connect with you know your 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 group mates for a project or something like that get some work done get something to eat um, and then you go home and it's more flexible and you know if it takes you eight hours if it takes you four hours if it takes you two hours whatever it happens to be you get your work done and then you leave um, when you don't have to be doing work that requires interacting with others right and you still have that opportunity to have those spontaneous connections and and, and run-ins in in the hallway or, or whatever it happens to be but you don't have to be there monday to friday nine to five right so i think a lot of businesses are looking for something that could be a bit more flexible and employees are looking for that too, right? Like that's one of the number one things that comes up in an interview where it's like, okay, is this hybrid or do I have to be here, um, you know, all week, every week? So, so that's two. So three then would be, you know, partnering with businesses and, um, you know, lawmakers, whatever it happens to be to, again, do a lot of groundwork on understanding what are people's biggest pain points you know whether it's um lunch having to be prepared every day whether it's the the commute time whether it's the cost whether it's the flexibility and just systematically going through ways that you can break that down and address those concerns head on right so if everybody's talking about the commute then okay can you have some type of transit credit or something like that if it's food then you know have those lunches or those those, those snacks or whatever happens to be um you know on deck for for employees so they don't have to think about that all those little things that you know make it a pain point for employees for not wanting to be in the office try to address those specifically right because the companies that do are going to get their fair share of the talent this is just a it, that's just how a free market works right so the companies that end up saying yeah we're going to give you lunch yeah we're going to you know take care of transit for you or you know get you a pass or um you know something like that people will you know be more willing to go to those companies instead okay so four then uh and i think this one is around just broadening the scope of companies that you can look at right so you know you're thinking about retail or um i think this one applies more to kind of retail where you're looking at bricks and mortar or restaurants that sort of thing in any kind of major you know metropolitan city you've got all kinds of diversity that you can tap into of stores restaurants types of food what have you that are all over the world that aren't yet solidified in your city right so i've seen lately a lot of restaurants um with more of kind of an asian influence coming into toronto here just because we have a huge community and a huge population for that where even if it's only asian people going to these restaurants they still got a business 
um, you know, a business proposal or a, they've still got a viable business from that just because there's enough people with that interest to support that business. So if you kind of look at it from that perspective of, okay, we're not just going to look at people from Toronto or from New York or from LA or from London or from wherever who want to start a business, we're going to look at this from a global perspective and look at companies that are doing well in other markets and try to get them to open a location here in our city. I think that is a huge way of looking at things because all of a sudden your market is no longer your city. It's now the entire world. And you can really be broad at looking at, okay, what kind of demographics do we have in our city that could support a business from whatever country that's doing well over there and we can bring it here so that people from that community can feel connected to that and, and patronize that business. So five then, now that we're seeing this shift towards services and who knows, this might be just kind of a temporary thing, but it's worth looking at, okay, instead of opening up more, you know, shoe stores or um, clothing stores or whatever it happens to be, think of more kind of service oriented concepts. So we'll see if the restaurant industry comes back the same way it was post COVID. I think it's too early to tell, but you know, things like escape rooms or karaoke, all that sort of thing. I'm just kind of, you know, listing off the top of my head, but ideas like that, that are a bit more service oriented and a bit more experience oriented could be more viable for this market and this kind of new world that we're in where if I want to buy a thing, I can just go online, have it shipped to my house. But if I want to have a karaoke night with my friends, I can't do that on Amazon, right? So those types of businesses could have a leg up in this new economy and do well in kind of a retail uh, environment. And then lastly, number six, especially for malls specifically, it might be time to rethink the anchor tenant, right? So when we think about kind of the Nordstrom's, the JC Penney's, the Sears, all those kind of guys that have been having a really tough time, it might not be the best thing to kind of rely on those types of stores to anchor a mall or a plaza or what have you. I think, um, you know, when you look at even smaller plazas that are anchored by uh, a doctor's office or a pharmacy. Um, just rethinking that in a way where it's like, okay, you have something like that and people are coming to that plaza no matter what, because they want to see their doctor, they want to see their pharmacist, whatever it happens to be. And then you put some food around it or whatever. And then that plaza is now a viable plaza because it's got an anchor tenant that rain or shine is bringing people in, right? So we're and I'm not gonna get too deep into this one because we've actually got another video that we're working on that goes a little bit deeper. But again, just rethinking who an ideal anchor tenant is, even if you're giving them a rent discount or what have you, um, you know, your typical department store tenant might not be the best fit going forward. So let's uh, let's get some concluding thoughts then just for investors and for leaders who are in this space, right? So if you are an investor looking to invest in this real estate, um, commercial real estate kind of landscape, a couple of things to keep in mind, or at least how I would approach it. Overall, I would be looking for companies that are excited and embracing this new world that we're in. If I'm reading their materials and it's all, you know, sad, doom and gloom, you know, post COVID sucks. When are we going back to how things were? If I'm getting that kind of vibe from reading all their materials, listening to, um, you know, their calls and that sort of thing, that's probably not a company that I want to do business with, with because the world is changing, right? And as a business, it's your job <laughs> to keep up with that and to be at the forefront of that if you want to be successful, right? So I would be looking at companies that are looking at this with excitement and saying, yeah, we're going to be investing in innovation, new ideas. We're going to be realistic about the harsh truths that are out there right now. Um, and we're going to be willing to be, you know, adaptable, 
flexible, different, um, and just kind of experiment and iterate until we find the right, um, the right balance, right? I'd be looking at companies that have a diversified kind of tenant and location base. Um, obviously, commercial real estate is very um, location and niche market kind of dependent. So I'd be looking at companies that have uh, holdings kind of all over the world in different markets, um, different types of tenants, so that that way they can be their own real time data source of knowing, OK, what's working, what's not invest more in what's working, pare down what's not, at least over the short term until you know you get a better sense of things. But if you're just a very small regional niche player, you don't really have that inbuilt experimentation kind of capacity. So it's a bit more difficult. And then lastly, just a, a company that's willing to invest in understanding who their end users are, right? So a lot of real estate companies might look at it as, you know, my customer is just, you know, the company that comes and wants to rent some space and give us a check. So that's, yes, that's maybe your first customer, but really who's, who's that business's customer? Who's the end user of this space? And staying on top of whether it's surveys or, um, you know, trends on social media or whatever it happens to be just being very in tune with that end user and designing spaces with that end user in mind, knowing that if you do that, then the companies that are aligned with that will be more success successful regardless, right? And then if you're a real estate leader, like if you're if you're actually in one of these companies and you're making decisions, you know, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of different things that we ran over today. I think maybe picking one or two that have the most relevancy for your business, starting with that and then building from there, right? Like I think it, it can be a lot to kind of try to bite off everything at one time and chew on all of it. Um, I think the easiest thing is to find what's kind of the 80-20 that'll kind of push my business forward the most. Start with that and then add something else, master that and then add something else and so on and so forth. So let's keep it there for now. Again, like, comment, subscribe, download, read, whatever it happens to be for you. Um, we are where you are. So appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Cheers.